I'd expect most listeners have at least once sat in a math classroom. Regardless of the level, one of the fascinating teaching principles behind math is that the learning starts from the base level, arithmetic and numerals. Though you don't learn how to classify the numbers you're using until later courses, like naturals, integers, reals, the underlying mechanics behind the functions of addition and subtraction are exposed to you via intuition. You can't really explain why 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, it just does. You take your hand, start off with two fingers raised, and raise two more. Addition is a primitive feature of the realm. It's sort of a law. It works the way it works. When you start learning computer programming, chances are you just get Hello World to print to the screen via the use of some provided functions which have layers upon layers, abstracting you away from how the electrical signals activate pixels on the screen. Arithmetic isn't as such. Algebra isn't as such. They work intuitively within our reality. From what I understand, it's somewhat of a popular topic within metaphysics, whether the human numerical representation and manipulation is proprietary to our species alone. But how many things does the average person play around with on a daily basis that are directly restricted by the laws of the realm? It isn't a reality that you gotta get up, do 50 push-ups, brush your teeth, and take a jog. This is a rule of existence you've established for yourself. Because you've probably read or heard somewhere that working out is generally good, that oral hygiene is more than likely good for you, even if you have arthritis and the constant bashing of your cartilage is probably terrible for you, even if you have chances of getting cardiac arrest because your heart is weak, even if you just plain hate using your legs as a transportation mode, people will still endorse running or walking and encourage others to do it. And cross-country runners will probably not be looked down upon societally. Not unlike some grass-smoking bachelor neat who could give two fucks about his health, weight, or relationships and just gets a surreal high from playing league all day long. So then, what must be encouraged? What is good? Forcing an apathetic, slightly autistic kid to do extracurricular activities to perhaps awaken some dormant interest within him, like he never knew he'd become a sax virtuoso till his parents forced him to join jazz band? Or should he just be left to his own devices and live out the welfare-funded, closed-in fantasy he's always wanted to? And if someone slips out the societal benefits from underneath him, if his anxiety is too much for him to handle and he cannot simply work within a rigorous, low-wage, normalized workspace, why is it not fine for society to just let him starve to death? And on the contrary, why is it not fine for society to throw in all the resources to pick up even the most stray sheep? I suppose that's what I've wanted to speak of. What within our reality has a Boolean value, and what will only be symbolized by fuzzy logic or simply can't be symbolized at all? I suppose the easiest to start with is the existence of physical objects. I don't think I've ever met a sane person who could disagree on the existence of an object in front of them. This isn't a discussion of the perception of the object, how they process the colors, volume, or how the object acts upon them mentally, just like the sight of an M16 probably produces completely different fuels for a NAM veteran and a 14-year-old kid. It's simply the acceptance of the existence of a physical body within 3D space. Is there a big glowing orb in the sky? On a sunny day, people will probably answer yes. I discount blind people and anyone who decides to digress with meta shit like define orb or but what is it to glow? Even with something as objective as the existence of an object, which can intuitively be relegated to true and false, there were probably philosophers out there who questioned existence and all sensory input. But if we can feel it with all five input senses, does it still mean it exists? If even that can be questioned, then what is real? Well, well for now, let's work with the intuitive notion of physical existence and move on to physical sciences. The reason I've added the physical qualifier is because political science doesn't fall within the category. In fact, science itself needs to be defined before we start discriminating between it. Science is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Political science is definitely not universal, since it operates on principles such as ethics, diplomacy, and human rights, concepts undefined in an ant colony. So then... Physical sciences will definitely characterize aforementioned existent objects. If the object exists, it 
probably also has dimensions and geometry, all within the realm of numeric representation. Let's say we're talking about a liter of water. This liter of water has a specific volume and molar mass based on its chemical properties right there at the atomic level. How this liter of water interacts with other chemicals, how quick it falls towards the earth, how fast it evaporates, etc. These are all set properties of H2O. They're defined by the universe. And we as humans can represent these properties within our own symbolic systems like chemistry, which is an application of physics, which is an application of math, which is the most fundamental science we as humans have besides primitive existential evaluation. It doesn't matter where this liter of water exists in this 3D realm, the object's properties, objective properties, will not change until the laws of the universe change. Water is water. So, here we are. Humans. Living in a world surrounded by some physical objects. Soil, grass, water, trees, rocks, air. The objects are what they are. But how do we see them? What do we do with them? And more importantly, how do we interact with other things like us? Other people? And even more importantly than that, how does one interact with oneself? Let's take the aforementioned word of the day, M16, a piece of metal and plastic. It's got a definite geometry to it. It's got what we humans classify as a handle, a stock, a socket to insert a cartridge of capsules called full metal jackets, a rifled pipe to direct a projectile. Its properties are set by the engineers who created it, the quality of the machining done upon it, and its interaction with other chemicals throughout its lifetime which may cause corrosion, aging, etc. What this object represents to humans no longer rests upon the object itself. It weighs upon the brains and bodies of each person interacting with it. To a former U.S. soldier, it's a lightweight, reliable, precise execution machine. He killed four enemy soldiers with it as a POW fleeing a torture chamber. To a peacenik, it represents corporate greed-driven human slaughter, as some nasty first world nation dares barge in an autocratic sovereign state and siphon their oil. He doesn't care what the weapon is, how it operates, what the specs of the M16 are. He cannot detach the thoughts of hatred, murder, and school shootings from an inanimate object. To the gun enthusiast, the M16 is just another gun. It's a thing that goes pew pew, has a specific range, fire rate, penetrative capabilities, etc. To the redneck, it's freedom in America, fuck yeah! What the gun does objectively is shoot projectiles at a high velocity. But the peacenik and redneck will go at it, staking out their notions of justice, ethics, and beliefs, each with an underlying notion that their position is correct, defending it oftentimes in the face of objective facts, from the opposition. The old NRA motto of guns don't kill people is objectively true. An inanimate piece of metal might have been designed with the intention to destroy property and tear flesh, however, it exhibits no default behavior on its own. It simply exists. It's used as a catalyst for destruction by the brain craving destruction. What I'm trying to get at is that both parties don't ask for the underlying purpose of the existence of the gun, even broadly why weapons existed in the first place. The underlying biological principle might be that humans are inherently violent through, say, our chimpanzee ancestry. Thus the question should be not as to whether or not the gun exists, but as to why we, as people, can never come to peace. The grim reality established by biology, an application of chemistry, an application of physics, itself an application of math, the most objective thing we know. But the brain isn't just an arithmetic engine. It's a neural network with perhaps thousands of layers of abstraction between it and the underlying mathematical principles of the universe. So then, to both the hippie and hillbilly I ask, why do we have to save the lives of innocent people? And, why do we have to prevent the spontaneous execution of innocent people? 
And chances are they will respond with the clusterfuck of equality, God and Bible, fairness, and all this other jazz attempting to justify either the active, aggressive prevention of an inherently violent species to destroy, or absolute apathy towards it. Because there objectively exists no right answer as to our knowledge of science so far, or perhaps ever, as this question lies beyond the principles of logic. There isn't anything objectively wrong with killing other people. Whether a human life has value or not is not true or false, and it can't even be specified by large set fuzzy logic. Oftentimes, the answer reduces to, Cause my feels. Because, well, shit. I ain't about that either. I too think it's wrong to mass murder a group of children or adolescents because some mental kid decides to cosplay the Matrix. But I really can't explain why. I can't say that there is anything wrong with the black hole sinking a galaxy inhibited by a plethora of prokaryotic cells or killing a random annoying mosquito, but how is their life any less important than that of a sophisticated, intelligent life form like a human being? The universe is impartial to the properties of an object. Every thing is merely a collection of chemicals. Life upon death simply dissolves into a concoction of other chemicals. So, <laughs> this whole ethics thing. Why do we universally agree on topics of theft, rape, and murder? Well, biologically, every hive needs to reproduce and spread. Even viruses, non-living objects exhibiting programmed behavior, exhibit these primitive functions. And what better way to disrupt the preconceived primary directive than by killing your own species? You ever see a virus go out and kill other viruses of its own kind, or bacteria go out and kill its own kind? Even on Earth, most mammals and birds of the same species don't actively attempt to kill each other. Outside of mating rituals where a couple males duke it out to access the genitals of the biological limiting factor. But we're humans. We are the wild card as we audaciously display individualism and are able to think. So, VR neocortex, we can get off the biological route and forge our own ethics. And oftentimes, that's what we do. Whether it be convincing ourselves that the youth and sabotage the legendary Aryan race, or that all Ruskies are dirty commies in disguise, or that anyone who doesn't carry about a yoga mat stretch five times a day and has a catchphrase, Allahu Akbar, is a dirty infidel that can rot in hell. Because that is what political science, ethics, and human rights devolve to. Religion. Yes, religion. Democracy is a religion. Communism is a religion. Fascism is a religion. Socialism, egalitarianism, feminism, and rationalism are all religions. Because somewhere upon a recursive call of why do you believe that when questioning one's beliefs, they'll land on the base case of, well, I just believe it. I believe that all humans can be equal, although the objective biological fact shows genetic differences across the body and brain within various regional populations. But we are humans though, right? I did just say that we aren't constrained by pure biology, thus we can forge a belief that humans are equal, that we all should have the right to vote, that white cisgendered males are oppressive shitlords who need to pay reparations to all the other races they've historically and systematically oppressed, that feminists are totally regressive dumb bitches who stagger the progress of civilization, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 70 virgins awaiting for any Muslim who kill a Christian infidel, and that all fags need to be saved by Jesus or they're gonna burn in hell. Or me with my belief that total nihilism is the only rational way forward, perhaps being the root cause of me making this video. And none of us are right or wrong, we just are. Who we are and our belief set might not be rational and isn't necessarily communicable or interpretable by others. To me, as a Westerner, the wild beliefs of radical Muslims are backwards, antiquated, and incompatible with my idealized Star Trek-esque version of the future. But who says the future need be a sci-fi fantasy rather than a massive neo-medieval over-glorified bloodbath? Which one is objectively better? Completely colored by one's perception of reality. And that's the point I've been trying to get to. To humans, with our higher cognitive abilities, perception is reality. Even as I, in parallel, argue for the universal truth of maths, 
Were we to have Big Brother in the Ministry of Truth and Force it, 2 plus 2 would equal 5. When you're a schizo, the voices in your head are real. When you're a feminazi, Donald Trump is Adolf squared. When you're on acid, the world is just one big circle, man. Not only that, but many of our beliefs will often be inseminated within us without consent. Like the last few Windows versions, your average Democrat or Republican oftentimes comes prepackaged with preconceived worthless shit. Like in 2008, when I've moved to the US, I remember Obama's like, hope and shit. In 2015, I see him universally decried for Obamacare by people who don't understand even what healthcare is. It's just shit they've heard from other convincing individuals on the television or the interwebs and decide to subscribe to and regurgitate on cue autonomously. Like many millennial students who take their stance on Brexit without even comprehending the picture entirely for a cringeworthy spectacle. Fellow, could you tell me uh, you're holding an EU flag? What are your three favorite things about the EU? Uh, free travel, uh, freedom of education across Europe, anywhere I want, and the increased economy. Okay, but the economy in the I, EU is the lowest growth in the whole world, they say. I don't really want to do it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Well, it's the lowest growth in the world, but I don't believe in growth. I believe in people. Thank you very much. I'm doing a little video blog. Can I ask just why you've come here today? And the, uh, the poster there is uh, uh, Miss you already are. Uh, one of them. Um, so, what was your name? Amy. And Amy, why did you come here today? Just horrified at the outcome of the referendum. And we want to do anything we can about it. And come to make our voice heard, which it hasn't been so far. And what horrified you about it? Uh, the thought that we might leave the EU and the consequences that I don't think were publicised in any way. Well, we weren't listened to. <laughs> and what are the consequences? Well, the economy, uh, the rise in racism that I've seen in my local area, and um, well, with the unknowns that we face. Um, so, as an EU fan, Amy, what would be the three best things about the UK staying in the EU? Uh, the stability. Oh, goodness, Georgia, help me out here. <laughs> That's really all I've wanted to say. We all are delusional to an extent, despite some of us having the staunch desire to state that the reality we see is the objective truth. It can't be. Because of our brains, these weird wrinkled organs, the operation of which is unbeknownst to ourselves. How can one know who one is without comprehending their own thoughts? I suppose that is what metacognition is, the attempt to decipher your being what you are, your preconceived interests and the desires, and how they color your reality. So I might be wearing those super thick, polarized, dark goggles like Isis or Westboro Baptist or Zoe Quinn. Some might be wearing light blue shades like atheists and liberals. Some might be wearing amber like rationalists and libertarians. But there ain't no one out there who's wearing a clear pair of glasses. So, the moral? Well... There really isn't one. I haven't uncovered some hidden truth or will attempt to convince someone to lead what I deem a good lifestyle. If hardcore scientific research and collecting Nobels is your thing, I salute you. If smoking a fat bowl for breakfast and playing Skyrim is your thing, I guess I also sort of salute you. If hunting down random white people and attempting to force them to pay reparation for insert victim narrative is your thing, well... Just keep on trucking. I'd expect